So, I'm Matt Heon, uh, I'm on the Potatoes team, and I've been working on Podman since the project's inception in 2017, and I'm here to tell to you about our new major version, Podman 5.0. So, uh, what is Podman? I'm assuming most people in here already know, but I kept the slide in just in case. And I'd like to focus on something new we've been doing that some people might not know as much about. So, Podman has always been Linux first. Containers are Linux, obviously. But recently, we've been making an effort to move over to additional platforms. Uh, we can't expect that all our developers are going to be on Linux. We have to expect that most people are going to be on a corporate-issued laptop, a Mac machine, a Windows machine especially. And to do that, to meet the developers where they are, we have to bring Linux to where the developers are. And that means virtual machines. So since about Podman 4.0, we've been working on something called Podman Machine. It's a way of running a basically single purpose Linux virtual machine that lets us run Linux containers on a Windows or Mac system. And just a bit of a time frame here, major version wise, Podman project starts in 2017, Podman 1.0 out in 2019. We've done about a major version per year from there until Podman 4.0, which came out in 22. And from there, we went about two years without a major version. We were relatively stable, doing mostly feature releases. Now, let's talk about what is in a version number and why especially the big 5.0 matters. Uh, Podman, since our 1.0, has used semantic versioning. Uh, in case you're not familiar with it, it's a major minor patch version scheme where major releases correspond to breaking changes, minor releases to features, patches to bug fixes, and small changes like that. So 5.0 is basically a license for us to make user-affecting changes that break things. But at the same time, 5.0, something like that, is also a bit of a marketing event. People get excited about major version numbers. People like to write articles about major version numbers. So it's the kind of thing where you want to put stuff in that people will be excited about. Big new features, for example. So let's get down to it. Why did we need to do a Podman 5.0? As I said, we had a good, stable two years of Podman 4.0. What's coming up that requires us to make a breaking change, that requires us to do that major version bump? And the biggest one is Podman machine, that virtual machine functionality. When we first started doing it, we were very much a containers team. We didn't have much experience in virtual machines. And we made some not particularly good assumptions, let's say, that needed a pretty big reworking to get us ready for the future, especially with the amount of people now using it. We now have Podman Desktop using Podman Machine. And we actually just saw a bit of Podman Desktop in the keynote. It's getting increasingly common. It's popular. And it's getting used in a bunch of places. Getting Podman machine ready for the future is the big reason we had to do a 5.0. Secondly, if we're going to make breaking changes anyways, we went through, we started looking at things, and we realized we were really abusing our config files. More details on this later, but we needed to do some breaking changes there. Finally, we want to do some big deprecations, big removals. We're not quite talking about RHEL 10 yet, but it's definitely on the horizon. It's something we're aware of. And if we have an opportunity to make breaking changes that let us move some code out of the supported space, let's say, so we don't have to be worrying about it in 10 years, something we would like to do. And then we also, we have a GitHub repo, obviously. We tag a bunch of stuff on that repo with next major version, just because this is a small change, but it's going to be breaking. And over two years, we've just accumulated a bunch of various GitHub issues that are, we can't do this yet. We'd love to do it, but it's going to be user-facing breakage. We have to wait for a major version. So we've decided that we want to do a Podman 5.0. Now when are we going to do it? The discussion starts off in, call it fall of last year, as we start to realize we're going to need to make some pretty big changes in support of the next versions of Podman Desktop. and from there, we have to work out when we can do this release. Then the big constraint on us is Fedora. Uh, we don't want to put a Podman 5.0 in CentOS and RHEL before we have it in Fedora for a while. That's kind of a mismatch we'd really prefer to avoid. 
So that means we can either do Fedora 40, comes out in April, it's actually been out for a while now, or we can do Fedora 41, October timeframe. And the way our schedule was working, we really wanted to get that release done for April. And that means we really have to get Podman 5 ready in somewhere in March. So now let's talk about what's actually in it. And the biggest thing are the Podman machine changes. These are largely to support Podman desktop, to support our initiative to put Podman in front of more people on Macs and Windows. And there are a couple really big problems we want to address here. First problem, we have four completely different backends. Each backend in our terminology is a separate supported virtual machine engine. At that point, we were supporting uh, QEMU on Linux, we were supporting Apple hypervisor on Mac, we were supporting uh, QEMU on Mac actually, it's technically five, but let's pretend it's not. And we were supporting WSL and Hyper-V on Windows. And all of these four backends, technically five again, did not have extensive code sharing. In fact, there was very little shared between them. We were running to, into a maintenance nightmare as we tried to patch things in five different places where we needed to fix things. Second big problem, uh, our Mac support was really lacking. QEMU was just not up to the task. At that point, it was our only supported driver. We were making some efforts elsewhere, but we were not having much success, and we knew we needed to do a major rewrite to get off of QEMU. It had some serious stability issues, we'll go into that more in another slide, but suffice to say, it's just not ideal for what we're trying to do. And finally, virtual machine images. Uh, we were on FCOS at this point, and Fedora Core OS was generally speaking good for what we did, but we had to customize those images, and we didn't have an easy way to do this at that point. We were running into some pretty serious problems because we wanted to do image customization, couldn't actually customize the images. That means before we boot the image, we have to run some RPM commands. RPM not necessarily known for being the fastest thing. We're exploding our boot times just because we have to get certain packages onto and off of the machine. So first up, uh, refactoring the various providers down into a more shared space. I should first explain why we have four different virtual machine providers with very little code sharing because I assure you there was at least some logic to it when we did it. Uh, basically, we start off with only two. We're supporting QEMU on Mac and we're supporting WSL on Windows. And WSL is not a very conventional virtual machine provider. It doesn't really want to be a VM. It wants to pretend it's as native as possible. A lot of things in a typical virtual machine like resource constraints, saying that you only have X amount of CPUs, that's just not really a thing in WSL. So when we looked at it, we looked at uh, QEMU and WSL, we said very little code sharing between these two, doesn't really make sense to have a single shared backend. Problem, we then start adding additional backends and the infrastructure we've built means they all have to be completely separate. And now all of these are a lot more in common with QEMU than not. So we have a lot of potential code sharing going to waste because of this poor early architectural decision. Uh, so what we want to do, we want to get all the code, especially the setup code, in common in one single place. We want to get the config files unified. We actually had completely separate config files for each uh, operating system. Just not a good place to be. And this required effectively a complete rewrite of machine. Uh, I want to say we did something like 9,000 lines of diff stat in a package with 5,000 lines of code at the start. So everything got changed. Uh, it did not, we were really hoping to get some savings in terms of lines of code here, like simplify things. We had to add a bunch of indirection, which we did not actually end up saving any code, but still, now we're patching things in one place instead of in four, massive improvement. Next up, Mac OS updates. So the QEMU driver that we were using. Firstly, it used 9P file sharing. 9P is not the best in terms of performance. We really wanted to move over to Vert IOFS, which is massively improved. And since most of the point of this virtual machine is getting code from your Windows or Mac laptop into the virtual machine to build in containers, having fast file sharing is essential. Uh, secondly, it's going to get us faster emulation. 
So all the new Mac machines are obviously on ARM64. We've got the nice M3 logo there. But people still like building AMD64 images. It's nice for production. We were having to use QMU user static, which performance on that, not the best. Uh, if you use the native Apple hypervisor, which is what we wanted to move to, you get uh, Rosetta. And Rosetta is a much higher performance solution. So getting away from uh, QEMU has those advantages, but the biggest reason we wanted to do it is stability. QEMU on Mac is not the best supported of platforms, and it's also updated frequently through Homebrew. And the thing about Homebrew is that the updates don't get tested particularly well before they go out. Uh, every time a major QMU update goes out through Homebrew, we start getting a storm of complaints that things are broken, things aren't working as expected, and it's not something we can control. We didn't control the Homebrew package, and we couldn't reasonably control it. So at this point, we have to take control of our own destiny, and that means we have to move to a better supported hypervisor. Fortunately, Apple provides a native one. We call it Apple HP internally. It gets us everything we wanted. It gets us Rosetta support, which wasn't quite able to land in 5.0. It ended up in 5.1. It gets us fast file sharing via Apple HP. And it gets us uh, a lot fewer stability problems. It's still not perfect. You might be hearing in the next few months about something called uh, Krun, I believe, libkrun which is a better way of getting GPUs into the virtual machine on Mac, which is something people increasingly care about. But yeah, for now, Apple HV is our solution, and it's a lot better than what we had. Next up, custom images. So before, as I said, we were using stock FPOS, but we have to customize. Uh, and to customize, we would really like to be doing things in our own way. We would also like to be solving versioning issues. We're about to make a major version bump. We're going to have some API incompatibility in there. We need a way of saying that a Podman v5 machine is only going to pull down a Podman v5 image. And there are obviously many ways you could do this, but we are a container software. It would be really nice if we could use our existing pull infrastructure to do this. So we're not quite on image mode yet. But we have all the elements in place, and we are actually pulling down our operating system images as OCI artifacts now. There's a quick screenshot of Quay here. You can see uh, we have a link to, actually not a link, but if you search on Quay for podman slash machine OS, you can see our OS images. It's basically just everything pat, uh, patched in under a single manifest. We've got three manifests here, 5.0, 5.1, 5.2. 5.2 is current upstream development. And under each of these manifests, you have a bunch of different VM images as artifacts. We have our supported operating systems, Linux, Windows, and Mac, and then our supported providers underneath them. And then multiple architectures, obviously. We're supporting AMD64 and ARM64 for all OSs. So doing everything as a artifact with our own build chain made a lot of sense. And hopefully all this is going to be image mode soon. Uh, just need FCOS to release appropriate boot to the images. Fingers crossed. Next up, migration. So I've just told you about a bunch of big things we're doing. We're completely changing the config file for Windows, Linux, Mac. We're completely changing the hypervisor on Mac. We're actually ripping out support for the old QEMU hypervisor because it was plain unmaintainable. Uh, what does that mean in terms of user experience? Are we going to require people to completely tear down their machines and make a new one? Or is there a way that we can get people onto a new VM and not require them to tear everything down? We talked about this a lot internally as a team. And eventually the hard conclusion is there's no way to migrate. The biggest issue ended up being our VMs are just based on the wrong images. Uh, if we're going to be moving over to these new uh, images that we're building ourselves, you need to completely tear down the VM and recreate it. We understand that this is a hard pill to swallow for people migrating V4 to V5, but it was really the only way we could get away from our tech debt. From here on out, we have version config files so we can make changes in a sensible manner that doesn't require complete refactoring, that doesn't require VM recreation. We have image-based builds so we can reasonably update the uh, VM images without having to do this. But for this one, this four to five transition, 
hard pill, but we're going to require a complete VM recreation. There was, oh, it's actually showing up. So I was supposed to have a co-presenter here. She unfortunately couldn't make it, but she actually has a Mac. I don't. So she was able to record a demo of what the new version of Podman Machine looks like. So this is the latest version of the old Podman 495. And let's just do a quick uh, machine list. Here's our old 49 machine. And we're just going to do a quick Podman machine start to show how long it takes. And I'm going to say quick with some pretty big quotation marks here. We're fast forwarding this because I don't want you to sit through it. It's a 40 second process to bring up this VM. Part of this is it's a Mac. We're using the old QEMU driver. Performance there was never the best. Part of this is the image things. We're running a bunch of RPM scriptlets as the uh, VM boot to remove and add various packages. And yeah, 43 seconds total to start the VM. That's obviously suboptimal. So let's go ahead and upgrade to 5.0. And unfortunately, as I said, going to have to remove the VM for that. And here we go with the installer. Go ahead and get that running. And nice and quick, we are now on Podman 5. So, quick check here. Technically, this is Podman 511. I've been talking to you about 5, but we've gone a bit further since then. And here we go. Let's do a quick machine init, which is going to pull down our OCI image. You can see the address here, PlayIO Podman Machine OS 5.1. And 1.1 gigs. Here we go. Let's go ahead and start and see how long that takes. And here, we're actually not going to have to fast forward. And there we go, 9.165 seconds less than a quarter of the time. It's pretty impressive what uh, moving to the actual image and moving over to the native hypervisor does. Next, let's just do a quick manifest inspect on the actual image we're using. And you can see in here, we've got a bunch of different sub-manifests, all set up for different operating systems and different architectures. And let's just look, take a quick look at the config file here. I said that we refactored it, and a big part of that was just to gain cone commonality, but here's a quick look at what the config file actually looks like. And it's just a JSON, so we can do a quick JQ on it. And about 90% of this is shared between providers. WSL, still very special, still the problem child, only shares about 25%, but it's on the fundamentally same format. So we can do all the same things with it. And here we go. This is an Apple M3, which means we are going to build an AMD64 image using Rosetta. And that gets us some very fast emulation, despite the fact that we're an ARM. So quick Podman build here inside the virtual machine. And here we go. So not only can we build for AMD64, we can actually run the images. Thanks to Rosetta again. Emulation is actually pretty handy. It lets you get access to the entire catalog of container images, despite the fact that you may not have the same architecture. And yeah, we have an AMD64 image running on an ARM64 laptop. So that was our demo. Uh, next up, so I told you that we needed to do some big work on config files. And this actually comes down to another mistake we made while implementing Podman Machine. So we were ending up using our config files more as a database than an actual config file. We have a list of connections to our various virtual machines. 
Uh, we call it Podman System Connection. There's a suite of commands there that lets you add them, remove them, list them, etc. We put these in the config file. The problem is that when you have commands that edit these connections, now all of a sudden we have commands that are rewriting the config file. This is a little suboptimal because every time we do that, we get rid of user formatting, we get rid of all user comments. Not a good thing to be doing. We initially thought we were going to have to do a pretty big breaking change refactor here, but thanks to Paul Holtzinger, who I believe is in the audience, we actually got away without doing that. And we are able to refactor all the bits that are changed into separate config files, but if you have an old config file that still has them in there, they are still accepted. So we are fully backwards compatible. So this is just a nice little bit of a cleanup. Turned out to be much less of a change than we were thinking it was, but still a nice improvement. Next up, uh, deprecations, removals, changes to defaults. This is basically a list of things that we wanted to do in preparation to our next big long-term support release that was going into whenever RHEL 10 is. I try not to remember dates, so I can't accidentally leak them. Uh, so, C groups B1. We wanted to remove this eventually, but there are just too many things still on it. Uh, C groups B1 is deprecated. It's actually going to be removed by system D probably sooner than we will get around to it, largely because of WSL. WSL is still stuck on D1. Uh, we will pop out an unpleasant error message if you're still trying to use it, but we will actually continue to work with it for the foreseeable future. And we have a bunch of little options in Podman Machine. Didn't bother listing them out individually, but with the big refactor, there's a bunch of things that changed. A bunch of options no longer fully made sense, especially around SSHP handling. We reworked the way we were handling that. So a bunch of our SSH options just no longer do anything because we adopted more sensible behavior. Next up, uh, complete removal. We are removing CNI support entirely in Podman 5. Two years ago with Podman 4, we implemented Netavark, which is our own network stack. And we did that because CNI was moving in a direction we didn't feel like we could support. They were doing things we couldn't really follow. And this is basically the culmination of that. CNI is not a place where we can reasonably continue to support it. So we're not compiling it anywhere except RHEL 9. Can't change the default there, so it's got to stay in. And FreeBSD, where it's actually the only supported driver. Next up, uh, BoltDB. So we did a database change in a very transparent manner. I don't think many people noticed it. We were using something called BoltDB, internal uh, Go database, very lightweight, also not particularly good at surviving data corruption. If you restart your machine at the wrong moment, uh, you lose all your containers, not a good thing. Moved over to SQLite last year, and we made it the default later last year. Thus far, nobody seems to have noticed, nobody's complaining, so that's a good sign. Completely turned off the ability to create new bulk databases. This puts us all on the new, much easier to support code path of SQLite. We're not going to turn off the bulk DB code at any point in the near future, but we are not going to let you create new uh, machines based on bulk. And then finally, we decided to change rootless networking from Slurp for NetNest to Pasta. So we need a networking tool as rootless to go ahead and set things up and basically do user mode network forwarding. We don't have access to IP tables or uh, NF tables. We need to do everything in user mode. Pasta is a drop-in replacement for Slurp or NetNest, but substantially higher performance. Seems like a natural fit. And then finally, we did some pretty substantial changes to CLI option parsing that hopefully no one will notice. Doesn't seem like anyone's filed a bug yet, so I'm optimistic about that. And then finally, other breaking changes. These are basically the things that have been accumulating in GitHub for two years, the things we can't justify doing a 5.0 for alone, but things we'd love to get in. And generally speaking, these are Docker compatibility changes. Back in the very early days of Podman, any time we had something that wasn't matching Docker compat, we would just change the command immediately, not do a breaking change because we treated those as bugs. But at this point, we have enough users that it would be really bad if we were changing the format of Podman to spec every single version. So when we do this, we make some relatively minor changes. You can see over on the screen here, we've got some terminal snippets showing some things that changed. And biggest one there, uh, top sh-c in brackets, that's a JSON array. We changed that to a, or yeah, 5.0 on the top, 4.0 on the bottom, 
JSON array from JSON strings, that's an unfortunate thing where the coding is completely broken. We're able to work around that by detecting if you have a Podman 40 client connecting to us and sending the old format, but still, we are doing this for Docker compatibility, and honestly, the old version didn't make as much sense. But things like this are things we like to keep aware of now because we do have a lot of users, and we are going to break people if we do this. Finally, features. I know I said at the beginning that a 5.0 should be exciting, and I've been talking a lot about things that we broke and things we removed, and I haven't talked about much about things we added. Uh, we had about three months to make a release. We committed to 18 different breaking changes, and we as a team did not feel like we had time to do more. However, this is the point where I get to be thankful because we have a community, and the community came to our rescue and added a bunch of stuff despite us not having time to do much more than breaking changes. Uh, special thanks to anyone who contributed to Quadlet during the 5.0 cycle. We had a lot of very good Quadlet changes. We added support for pod units, added a couple of additional things within the unit. So Quadlet getting nice and mature now. And yeah, thanks very much to the community. Uh, we were afraid this was going to be the Podman Snow Leopard release where we did nothing but remove, and it wasn't. Uh, next up, development. We started off in November of 23. We knew we needed a release candidate out by Fedora or February 13th for the Fedora 40 beta, managed it in February 18. Seven total release candidates. You can tell there's a lot of changes here. Development was ongoing basically until the last RC. And final release came out in March 19. We had a healthy margin before Fedora 40. And for the most part, everything may, was relatively smooth. It's been supported in Podman Desktop since 1.10. And we had some breakage, but we'll talk about that next. I, you mentioned, I mentioned earlier that we changed our default network stack from Slurper NetNest to Pasta. And Pasta is really a lovely tool. It is a lot higher performance. It has an excellent upstream community. I don't believe Stefano is in the room, but if he is, uh, you made a great tool, and we love you, and thank you so much for answering our bug reports. Uh, but yeah, it turns out that it is not as one-to-one -one of a drop-in as we hoped. There are a lot of issues in the early days where rootless networking was not doing what we expected, and we ended up answering a lot of bug reports away into this. We're still committed to Pasta. We think it's the way forward, especially because of how active the upstream is. But this is probably the biggest area of problems in 5.0, and one that we are working through pretty steadily. Oh, I should say that we're keeping Slurp for NetNest as a dependency of the package. So. If, you, if we did break you, you can just use uh, hyphen hyphen net equals slurp for net nest. Your container continues to work. Until pasta is actually a drop in, we'll just keep it around as a dependency. And then finally, uh, where do we see ourselves going next? Podman 5.1 was actually released in late May. It's out now. A small release with a number of new features, including Rosetta support, which didn't quite make it into 5.0. 5.2. Currently planned for late July. It's going to be the, in the next uh, major version, minor version of well, I should say, 9.5. And beyond that, we're not quite sure, but we're hoping to do at least two more releases this year during fall. And then Podman 6. Uh, we're not committing to a Podman 6 at any point in the near future, but I will make this guarantee. It will be at least next year. We do not do major version bumps at anything less than a 12-month cadence because Breaking changes should not come that often. All right, here's a bit of our socials, and now on to questions. Yes. Uh, Dan is asking about BSD support. So uh, let's see. We have BSD support through the helpful support of the BSD community. Uh, they actually approached us and added us, added it on their own initiative. We are very thankful to them, and it seems to be going well over there. Uh, we don't have much interaction with their maintainers, though. Mostly, they figure out what's broken, and then they send us patches to fix it. Wonderful arrangement where we don't have to do much supporting. But yeah, 
Uh, our upstream community doesn't have much interaction with BSD. I feel like the BSD folks mostly deal with the BSD maintainer. Yes. So FreeBSD, uh, actually the question. The question is what hypervisor do we use for FreeBSD support and what file system for it? And the answer is we do not have a hypervisor. They have something called OCI jail, which is a fully OCI compatible runtime using FreeBSD jails as a back end. And they have native Podman using a native OCI runtime via that. I don't know what they're using file system wise. I assume it's some variant of an overlay file system, but not 100%. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you everyone for attending.